Hey everyone, this is Abhishek Pradhan and today we are going to talk about the budget of India for the year 2023. So, let's get started. So, if I had to analyze you the current year budget in a single sentence, I would say that the budget of 2023 aims at future perspective or future goals or should I say the Amrit Kal. Now, what I mean here is uh, the budget, uh, the provisions included in the budget won't be beneficiary to the citizens of India right at the very moment, but rather at a future perspective or in the upcoming years. And I do appreciate it, but I personally believe that few provisions uh, beneficiary to the people right at the very moment should also have been included in it. So before we dig deep into the analysis of our budget, let's have a small brief about the global crisis that we all are facing. The whole world is going through the time of globalization, which means slower growth in economic GDP in a global scale. The reasons are many. Uh, it can be the Ukraine-Russia war effect or the geopolitical issues or the economic instabilities between uh, various countries. Um, the reasons and the impacts are very vital and crucial. One of the impact being is there is a high interest rates in the US from 0.5% to 4.5 percent per annum in just nine months and another fact would be the depressing GDP growth rates we have a survey which indicates the uh, US with a growth rate of 1 percent in GDP when it comes to UK it's 0.3 percent matters are worse for Germany with a GDP growth of minus 0.3 percent when it comes to China it has uh, reached a sustainable uh, kind of ecosystem with a GDP growth of 4.4 percent and coming to India, the matters are in favour of India with a GDP growth of 6.1%. And I believe it is because of this economic stability during the time of crisis and the vision of Amrit Kal that the current budget is focusing on the future perspective, not in the beneficiary in the current year. So the major agenda of our current year budget is recession looming the world, taming the inflation yeah, and the vision of Amrit Kal. So now let's start with the actual analysis of the budget. First of all, we'll be talking about the MSMEs or the small scale sector units. It won't be wrong to state those small scale sectors as the actual backbone of our nation. The reason being, there are 13 crore small scale sectors which consists of 45% of manufacturing unit which contributes 30% to the GDP. Added to that, they have 95% of the industrial units. So, talking about the policies and schemes introduced for MSME, yes, I will appreciate the budget. Uh, schemes like 95% forfeited amount to government tenders to fail contractors to be refunded. So, those contractors who fail to complete the tender in the right time will be given a refund of 95% of their investment. Now, this is important because this will fluctuate better working capital and with better working capital, they'll have resources to plan on the future perspectives. Another common problem seen in small scale sectors is the delay in payment from corporates. Uh, whenever a small scale sector is pro giving its product to the corporates, the corporate is benefiting from the tax policies uh, that the government has laid down. But the small scale sector is burdened uh, with the loan. He might have taken loan for his production cycle. But uh, the delay in uh, the delay from the corporate in payment to the small scale sector will elongate this duration of loan which will further burdenize the small scale sectors. But thanks to the budget, it's not going to happen anymore. The budget states only after the corporates pay the small scale sectors their money will they be eligible to benefit from the tax policies. Now talking about ECLGs, ECLG stands for Emergency Credit Line Guarantee Schemes. Now these are the schemes that are introduced during the time of high inflation. Um, in the recent months, we have seen a drastic increase in the uh, price of petrol. Now, when fuel rate increases, the prices of everything, generally everything also rise. So this becomes really um, hard for the small scale sectors to get their raw material because they are already burdened from the loan. At the same time, when there is a high price in the raw materials, how are they going to compensate with it? So the budget includes 2 lakh crore extra collateral free loan which is given at 1% lesser interest. 
Now this will fluctuate better working capital and will at least relax uh, the small scale sectors from the burdens of taxes, burdens of inflammation, burdens of um, avail availability of raw materials and furthermore. So those were some of the policies which were included for the small scale sectors and I do appreciate them. But there are a few drawbacks, one being the delay in payments. Survey states, out of 61,461 cases registered, which yielded to the amount of 20,771 crores. So these are the figures of delayed payment. 61,461 are the number of cases of delayed payment filed by the small scale sectors. Only, I repeat, only 26,902 cases were registered. And only, again, 56,000 crore was disposed. What about the remaining amount? See, present small scale sectors do need much of a help in making doing business. They have that idea or they can do manage themselves in, an, in a country like India. But when the money is stuck, right? When, is, when the money is stuck, it's really very complex to get back that money and the judicial system is uh, time consuming, which further burdenizes them with the long running duration of the loan. So if the budget is taking care of this delay factor, it will be even more beneficiary for the small scale sectors. Now moving on to our another fundamental pillar, we have startups. Sounds interesting, right? Yes. India has seen a drastic rise in the number of startups from 500 startups in 2016 to 85,000 startups till this date. So when it comes to startups, yes, the government has again uh, introduced good policies in the budget. But here we need to understand that the government will support much to the small scale sectors rather than the uh, startups. The reasons being, startups, um, the number of total startups, right, are only 85,000. Whereas uh, small scale sectors, they consist of 13 crore. Look at the ratio. Next we have startups only generate like 9 lakh jobs whereas uh, small scale sectors they generate 40 crore jobs. So you can understand the development ratio and why the government supports more to the smallest sectors rather than in the startups. Now talking about the policies we have IT benefits extended for 3 years. Now this is very uh, comfortable for the startups. This is because the initial phases of startups are generally they run in losses. So when they have the IT benefit it uh, gives them a little bit of relaxing factor but that's a good thing. Next we have um, startup funds which is invested in agri-tech. Now this is, uh, I'll say I'll be appreciating this, this because India right has been given a title of the agricultural nation, agricultural country. So unless we have that uh, revolutionary ideas in the field of agriculture, I don't feel like they're justified with that title. So yes, I would appreciate uh, the new investment in the agricultural field. Now this would increase the rural entrepreneurs to bring up their own revolutionary ideas in the field of agriculture and that's a great thing. Next we have carry out losses for uh, 10 years. Initially it was 7 years, now they have uh, changed it to 10 years. Now this is another relaxing factor for the star uh, new startups. This is because initially they run in losses. So now they are able to compensate the losses within the taxes uh, for 10 years. So they have an increment period or relaxation period of another 3 more years. So those were some of the positive aspects for the startups introduced in the budget but there are also a negative part of it. So talking about the drawbacks, it will be the double taxing system in ESOPs. Um, now let's understand what ESOP really means. Um, for example, if you are working in a startup, uh, in order to encourage you to keep on working in the same company, you will be given certain share in the startups. Now when you get that share, right, you even have to pay taxes on that but the problem is you have got the share in a documented format, not in your bank account. But still, you have to pay taxes on that. And in a later stage, when your share reaches to a level of maturity where you can sell them, you have to pay taxes again. So for the same share, you are paying tax twice. Now that's the double taxing system I was talking about for ESO. And that's something which should be taken care of in the budget, in the, at least in the forthcoming years. That's one of the factor. Talking about another factor is the startup, right, it's a very complex system. The startups struggle in lack of communication, lack of information and a lot more. So in my opinion, what I believe is there has to be a separate ministry for startups. Now come on, we have ministry for each and everything that we can think of. Why not for a startup? 
So once that happens, right, the government policies like Made in India, all those will be able to channelize their own vision and pass it on to the new startups and that will also help the government to grow at the same time will encourage more and more entrepreneurs. Now let's talk about another fundamental pillar of economy, that's infrastructure. You know, John F. Kennedy says, America has good roads, not because it's rich, but America is rich because it has good roads. Among all those pillars of economy, infrastructure is really different because it has a um, capital generation cycle of its own. Uh, starting off, when you spend on infrastructure, right, it will lead to creation of job because we need labor, we need manpower, so jobs are created. Now, once job is created, it will lead to the increase in consumption of our resources. Oh, you need raw materials, you need natural resources to construct any infrastructure. Next, when you have that capital, right, you can further in invest it back again in infrastructure. So each time you run with the loop, you are profiting. Each time the money runs in the loop of infrastructure, it multiplies three times. Uh, now let me make it much simpler for you. Now if you invest one rupee, right, uh, 90 pesa of that one rupee will only be invested in economic growth. But if you include that one rupee in uh, infrastructure, it will contribute to 3% in the GDP. Now this is because that one rupee will also be included in the creation of jobs, in the utilization of natural resources, and a lot more. So you have three aspects which is covered within just one single rupee. So each time money runs in the cycle of infrastructure, it comes in a return of three times. So one real-time example that I can give you is the 25 km Noida Express. Though it's just 25 km but it has seen 1 lakh plus apartments at the same time huge number of MNCs. Now that has created a lot of job opportunities, a lot of infrastructure development and a lot more. So talking about the government policies in the budget, we have Bharat Mala Pariyojana which states 142 million working days will be given. So 142 million employment days which will also generate a revenue of 2.2 crores. Now this will encourage new businesses, new manufacturing units, new provisions, new facilities to be developed in and around the infrastructural units. Now that is where infrastructure plays vital role because it not only develops the its own aspect but also its surrounding. Whenever you see an um, infrastructural development, the surrounding area will also develop. Next, we have a separate fund of an amount of 10,000 crores which is going to be invested in the perspective of urban development. Then we have the Green Hydrogen Mission for which 19,700 crores are allotted. Now this was important because India was really lagging in this perspective. So yeah, that is appreciable. Uh, next we have the revival of 50 airports and heliports for which 1,244 crores are invested. Now the next one is my personal favorite. It states last mile connectivity. Last mile connectivity is going to reduce the cost of logistics by 8%. Initially it was 16%, now it's going to be reduced to 8%. So what this last mile connectivity means is, um, we are actually paying taxes of uh, travel duties in any products we buy. Uh, be it clothing, be it food, everything has its own travel duties. So initially those travel duties were 16%, now it has been reduced to 8%. For example, if you are buying any product for Rs 100, initially you were paying 16 rupees as travel duties. Now it is reduced to rupees 8. Since we are discussing about infrastructure, let's talk about railways. Well, in my personal opinion, yes, the government has done spectacular investment in the sector of railways. It has invested 2,40,000 crore in the railway sector, which is considered to be as 9 times greater than it has invested in the decade. Now this was important because even though we consider ourselves well versed in railways but still there are a lot of areas especially the northeast who suffer from poor connectivity. Next we have the addition of new trains, Vande Bharat to be precise aka the smart train. Uh, counting from number 8 to 40 trains to be introduced in the recent months. Now this is vital because it will further increase the connectivity at the same time sustain the availability that is uh, required in the increasing demand. Next we have another scheme called as One Station, One Product. So under this scheme, uh, it has 
five stations consisting of 572 products. So what's happening in this game is uh, each station or uh, area has its own popularized product. So the government is trying to give those products an identity of their origin or the places from which they are being originated or they are manufactured. For example, Kanchiwaram silk from Chennai and Madhubani artwork from Patna. So moving on to our next pillar of economy, it's the digital infrastructure. Now that includes the UPI transactions, the network that we all use, might have heard of the 5G, right? So for those who don't know, UPI stands for Unified Payment Interface. And India is one of the leading countries with high transaction rates. India is having 376 banks which allow online payments. Added to that, the transaction worth of India in December 2022 was 12.82 lakh crores. While well, talking about the network ecosystem, Piyush Goel says 5G ecosystem is expected to contribute $450 billion in the Indian economy in the next 15 years. So the government has financed Rs 4,795 crores in the Digital India program. But there comes a problem. Um, the majority of these sectors are financed by the government. Studies say only 5% of infrastructure needs are financed through private sources, which leaves a very little scope for the private sector to venture into this department. So, in my opinion, yes, the private sector should also be encouraged to have its role in investment so that the government has its own backup stock to invest in some other perspectives. So, that was me analyzing the budget of 2023. Hope you all enjoyed it. For more such videos, make sure you like, share and subscribe. Until next time, thank you.